Uh, this is May the 16th. We are in the Red Room of the Presidential Suite on the 8th floor of the library. Uh, and the uh, person being uh, under the gun today is Elspeth Rostow. Um, Elspeth, your association with President Johnson goes back a good many years, but uh, why don't you uh, let's start talking about when you first encountered him and how, and, and, and we'll take it from there. I certainly saw him during the Kennedy inaugural, but always in a large group, uh, and I never had any sense of knowing him as a human being. Uh, but during the Kennedy years, I remember going out to the vice president's house and the first thing that startled me was my initial sight of a baron of beef. I had never seen, I guess, the rear end of a steer before on a dining room table. Uh, and I was optimistic as someone who likes rare beef, only to discover that it was well done beyond edibility. Uh, I was told by someone, not the press, not the vice president, but by someone, that if I had been a Texan, I would never have eaten beef rare. And this advice has remained in my mind, if not in my mouth, uh, these many years. Uh, that was the first time I talked to the pre vice president then, met Mrs. Johnson, and saw the elms. Uh, a pleasant but not overwhelming house. Uh, the next time was much closer. It was a dinner at Joe Alsop's, and the guest of honor was, of course, the vice president, still Kennedy years. Uh, it, w it must have been summer because Lyndon Johnson was wearing a startlingly white dinner jacket. Uh, I have to add that protocol under Kennedy forbade white dinner jackets. Uh, he, he felt that uh, appropriate summer garb was a black dinner jacket uh, as winter. So nobody in the Kennedy entourage ever took out their white dinner jackets. I think for the memory was simply that this was Eisenhower image. This was suburbia. This was not chic. So the, with all the other men, Kennedy style garb, Lyndon Johnson not only towered physically, but he shone brightly. It turned out that he was seated on Joe's right. I was seated on Lyndon Johnson's right. And you can fix it in time, though I haven't checked because it was the, maybe the day, at least the period, when Deke Slayton had been washed out of the astronaut program uh, because of a bad heart. And LBJ thought this was most unfair. And he, he said that just because you'd had a heart attack or had whatever trouble Slayton had shouldn't have disqualified him for the astronaut activities. And to follow it up, he, to the eager interest of Joe, who was following this closely, uh, said, you know, I've, uh, I had a bad heart attack, and of course, we all remembered that from the 50s. But he had his electrocardiogram in his dinner jacket, and he put his hand in and took out this small electrocardiogram and showed it to Joe who, looking beyond him, to me, he didn't exactly wink, but it was a, a static wink, and he examined it and said, very interesting, very interesting, he gave it back. Well, we had other subjects that evening, uh, and it was a, a time when I had a sense that not only did I not understand Texas beef, but I didn't really understand Texans. Uh, I enjoyed the evening, but uh, I had a feeling that this was not a world in which I would find myself comfortable. So the remarkable thing is that many years later, I 
became politically socialized, or at least semi-socialized as a Texan, and have enjoyed now over 30 years here. But those are the only memories that I have before Dallas. You changed your uh, ideas about beef? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, during the, uh, the years that uh, your husband, Walt, was in the State Department, um, did, you, did you have much reason to be in contact with President and Mrs. Johnson then? Yes. Uh, from the, the time, well, Walt went to the State Department in, I think, December of 61 and stayed there until 67. Uh, so it was a long time. Uh, but after, uh, after President Kennedy was killed, uh, there were many occasions where I would be invited to women's activities in the White House. There was a program, you probably know, know what it was called, something like Women Doers. Uh, and I attended those. I don't remember the dates. Uh, but, of course, while Walt was in state, I saw less of the people around the White House than I had both before and, and after. Uh, then came the time when he was called back in to succeed Mac Bundy. Right. From, that, from that time on, your lives were pretty much inter intricately uh, woven with uh, the Johnsons in one way. Mm -hmm. Uh, there had been rumors that Walt was going to be appointed. Uh, there was a, a rumor that I think that he was going to be there with, was it Bob Kittner? Anyway, uh, I had the impression, maybe generated by the media, that President Johnson didn't like, uh, he liked surprises when he made them, but he didn't like leaks ahead of time. So there was some media discussion of his impending appointment of Rostow and maybe Bob, I don't know. Uh, and President Johnson was said to be very unhappy about this. We were out one night at a Japanese restaurant with English friends and a call at the White House had tracked us down. Uh, it was a restaurant was named the Osaka and I thought of this in retrospect as the night of the Osaka. Uh, it was long before there were, well, the Osaka was not a restaurant where they could bring you telephones. Uh, it was a fairly simple place, and the only place where Walt could take a call from the president was by the cashier. And LBJ was very noisy about a leak, and it, Walt had not leaked, but the president w wanted to find out all that Walt knew about it. And so the our two English guests and I could see from the distance Walt sort of holding the phone away from his ear while the president tore a strip off him. Uh, it, it turned out to be the only time he ever did it. Uh, he never again uh, was, the word abusive is wrong, was not, he never again was uh, critical of Walt in that, in that fashion. Uh, but as we came back from the Osaka, we were concluding that hit whatever chance he had of getting Mac's job had, had gone up in smoke, literally, uh, while we were out, presumably, for a, uh, an evening of, of jollity. What, uh, um, you know, what we want to get into is, is, uh, as, as delicately but as efficiently as we can is your impressions of President Johnson through the through the, the the rather special relationship that you had with him. How, how do you see him overall? The first time I really thought that I liked him very much was out on a I don't remember the name of, but well, it was not the Honey Fitz something. Any case, it was uh, on Support. the Potomac. A big enough vessel, it was again good weather, uh, and there were various people around. First of all, in the corridor, I saw a group of men not playing poker, I could tell that, but as far as I could tell, they were playing dominoes. And I had never seen grown men 
with dominoes, so this fascinated me. One of them was Jake Pickles, it turned out. Uh, but I, again, realized that I had a learning curve that I'd better get onto, and I was told that dominoes was a, a macho thing to do in Texas. But the smoke that came out of the room, the sight of these men busily playing with tiles, uh, that was the first thing. And then up on the deck, uh, I sat near the president, who was in good form and funny, and uh, he was not at that moment playing dominoes, but talking. There couldn't have been too many people around. And I began to see a warm and witty, I use the word witty rather than just funny, because he was both, uh, and a really very, very nice fellow. Uh, I remember telling Walt afterwards that I thought I was going to like, like him, uh, but it was an aquatic experience. It was, a, uh, again, a, uh, the president was wearing very simple clothes appropriate to the occasion, shorts, uh, and uh, I felt that I, I was in a different world, but that I was going to be comfortable in it. It is any, any particular part of his, any particular episode of his, uh, uh, of a demonstration of his humor uh, occur to you that, that sticks in your mind? No, he, it was, I think, I may be wrong, but I think it was Hill Country Stories. He was, he was talking a bit, maybe I had raised the question of dominoes, maybe he was the one who explained it, but he, he talked in a, a warm and a, a very engaging fashion about a, a rural part of this country, which I, as someone from New York City, had little, had no experience of. Uh, and he talked about his family later on when uh, we had teenage children who had teenage problems. I remember him talking again about how his father, when he, I think he wrecked a car, uh, and his father uh, drove him around town, say, telling everyone, this is my boy Lyndon, uh, and standing behind him, as we had a son who had not wrecked a car, but uh, hadn't distinguished himself. Uh, and I liked this. Uh, I liked the fact that he was always compassionate with say members of his official family who had problems. Uh, and he just struck me as someone who didn't fit the image of uh, a brutal boss, someone who put, the, put his arm on people. Uh, and he certainly, as far as Walt was concerned, never did. Uh, he knew that Walt played tennis, wanted to play tennis, as often as possible. But he instructed the White House board not to bother him if he was out on the court, but have him call back afterwards. And sometimes they'd call home in winter. Walt would play in, I don't know where, I never went there, some covered court. And he would leave at 6.45 in the morning, get into his whites before dawn, take his clothes along and change, get to the office by, I don't know, eight sometime. Uh, but uh, if, if a call came from the White House, uh, the instructions were, oh, he's playing tennis, don't bother him. Uh, so that, that kind of consideration, uh, his chivalry towards my mother who lived with us at that point, who was very old, uh, and his almost flirtatious attitude towards her. Uh, of course, she warmed up to him uh, in instinctively. He knew how to be uh, chivalrous, as well as, I'm sure, uh, very direct. But his 
he, he literally apologized several times in my presence for using the word damn. And I had heard it before, and I was not shocked. And I felt really quite comfortable with the fellow who'd used the word damn, but the apologies came. It's, it's well known that he had a great regard for your um, uh, judgment and your abilities. Did he ever, do you recall any instance in which he asked for your, your advice or your participation personally in anything? Once at Camp David, uh, at that long table in, I think it was Laurel Lodge, uh, the plate glass window acted as a mirror after dark. If you were sitting, in, I was, I was on his left. He was at the end of a long table. And he turned to me and said, what do you think President Roosevelt would have done in my situation? I assumed that this had something to do with Vietnam, but I then began to talk about how fortunate FDR was in coming in at a time when the situation in the country was such that he was given a free reign. Uh, I, said, I thought that, that FDR's good fortune, you wouldn't normally think that being a president in a depression and a war was a lucky break, but it, it, in terms of presidential activism, it was. And Roosevelt could push his policies through. Roosevelt could act as Dr. New Deal in the Depression, as he called himself. Dr. Win the War during World War II, as he called himself. And uh, the country accepted this. So I, I talked about how different the world of the late 1960s was, in my eyes, from the situation that, uh, that Roosevelt had encountered. But uh, I think probably in the end I said that the president took very seriously, President Roosevelt that is, took very seriously his commitment to fight Hitler. And he might have assumed that the Cold War imposed the same kind of uh, imperative on his successor. And my hunch was that Roosevelt would have acted much as FDR, as LBJ did under very different circumstances when, quote, the grain of history was not running with him to the extent that it had run with uh, the second Roosevelt. Uh, he, he often asked me what I was teaching uh, and how I found the students. Uh, in fact, at one point, I think there's a picture we have, uh, some state dinner where a Middle Eastern guest was present. I think it was an Arab. And FDR, <laughs> getting my presence jumbled, and LBJ uh, turned to his Arab guest and said, I'm going to teach a course with Mrs. Rostow when we get to Texas. Uh, this was, of course, at the, the very end. And the ex expression of amazement in the eyes of the, the guest uh, turned out to be prophetic because the course never materialized. Uh, but he, he did. He did show it uh, as I think all presidents, I, well, I'm not sure all of them, but most of them, have a sense of sequence, have a sense of the other people who've been in that building, in that job. And uh, well, for example, once on Air Force One, I found him reading a biography of James Buchanan, of all people. Uh, and I asked why, why Buchanan, who was clearly not one of the outstanding presidents. He said, well, he was, he was president at a time when the country was about to get into war. And he, he didn't do anything that helped. I, 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 he didn't finish the sentence, but my hunch was that he was trying to see what kind of mistakes he could avoid in a, a dissimilar but somehow evocative period a century later. 
what <coughs> what is your um, personal assessment of the relationship between uh, the president and Walt? I think he, I think LBJ respected Walt for his mind, for his willingness to stand up for principle. Uh, and they seem to get along very well. Uh, he often talked to me about how helpful Walt was to him. The most spectacular moment for this came when the day Clark Clifford was sworn in as Secretary of Defense. There was a uh, meeting in, I guess it was the, in the East Room, and then a reception afterwards. And Walt left to go back to his office, and I went down the line. And the president was effusive about something that Walt had done. And he, he kissed me, rather moist kiss, on my forehead. Uh, and as I left and went out, a man seized me and said, haven't seen you for a long time, and kissed me roughly on my chin. And that was Bob Kennedy. And I went back to teach that afternoon, and I wondered whether I should not wash my face for a while, but preserve these wet smacks at two different levels of altitude from two quite different human beings. But it proves that Bob Kennedy was there at the Clifford swearing in. Uh, but it also, the, the enthusiasm with which the president talked about what Walt was doing, uh, I think was real. And he, he went out of his way to emphasize it. And he, I think he was more, well, to me at least, he talked more about Walt's virtues than he did to Walt. Uh, sometimes at the ranch, he'd talk to me about how helpful Walt was. Uh, and certainly Walt stood by him. You, you and, uh, and, and Walt were in the White House on the day that President Johnson announced that he was not going to run again. Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, did that announcement come as a surprise to you? Uh, go over that, your, your, your feelings about that time. Of course, there'd been gossip rumors uh, about Johnson's intent. Uh, it was a, a Sunday, as I recall it. Uh, Susan Mary Alsop had been around in the afternoon. She was trying to persuade my mother to write another book. Mother was in her 90s. Or, anyway, no, she wasn't in her 90s. She was in her 80s. But mother wasn't, at that point, energized to write another book. And Susan Mary was pushing her in this direction. So I didn't have much time to prepare for the evening, but went off. Uh, and. I, when we, I saw the president when he went down to give the speech that included the uh, decision not to run again, uh, he'd asked Walt and others to check earlier when Harry Truman made a similar statement uh, in 1952 and found that it was at the end of March. So Walt was prepared, as I was not for this possibility. And Walt knew that there had been a part of this, I guess it was the State of the Union message, which included the statement, the, the Sherman-esque statement, I, I will not run, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so one half of the family was prepared for this. Uh, I was the part that was not. And seeing the president go off, I could see that Members of the family looked stricken. Uh, Linda was there. Lucy was there. Uh, I don't remember seeing Mrs. Johnson ahead of time, but I must have done so. Uh, in any case, then came, we watched on television. We were asked if we wanted to go wherever it was that the taping took place. Uh, but some of us said no and stayed behind. And Again, there's a picture of Marnie Clifford and me 
taken, I imagine, just about the moment the president was saying he was not going to run. And we, we look in shock, not in shock and awe, just shock. Uh, and uh, amazement uh, gave way then to a sort of a discussion of what happens now. The president came back and he was really jolly. I can't think of another word for it. Well, he was pumped up. He'd made this big decision. And then he started making telephone calls uh, to David Rockefeller. I think a call came in from Nelson to other people. The Crims were around. They, of course, had known much more about it. They'd been there all day. And I think it tried to persuade him, dissuade him from making the announcement. Uh, but uh, there was a, uh, it was not exactly an atmosphere of a wake. Well, I've never been to a formal wake, so I don't know what the atmosphere is, but it had some, I'm sure, some of the qualities of a wake uh, for those who had been uh, part of the, uh, the Johnson administration. And I remember going home and finding a call from Susan Mary saying, why didn't you tell me? And my answer was, of course, that I didn't have anything to tell at that earlier hour. Um, as a, uh, you, you, you've, you've known President Johnson on two levels, a personal level and then uh, as a, uh, although, although involved and attached nonetheless as a scholar and an historian, what is your assessment of him as president? Uh, speaking now, not just as a friend, but, uh, but as, a, uh, uh, as a scholar. He'll get very high marks for his <coughs> social policies. Uh, the fact that people who had been highly critical earlier have switched is, I think, uh, understandable. I'm talking about people like John Kenneth Galbraith, Arthur Schlesinger, even George McGovern, who, attacking LBJ across the board at first, have now decided that he did remarkable things on the plane of social policy. Civil rights, 64. Voting rights, 65. Well, the, the, the long list. The first administration to pass legislation for higher education. Uh, creation of new bodies, the national endowments, et cetera, et cetera. He's going to stand, uh, people I think are probably, at least in the short run, going to make a distinction, a disjunction between Johnson, the domestic president, and Johnson, the figure uh, associated, incorrectly by the way, but associated almost exclusively in many minds with Vietnam. Uh, in my own view, uh, the president's policy was intermestic. This is a horrible word, but it puts together international and domestic. And I see a great similarity between what LBJ did at home for the other America, uh, to use that word, that phrase, and what he did abroad. He really was concerned with human, vi human beings, with values, and with protection of vulnerable cohorts, whether they were children, elderly, uh, and people in developing countries who had no way to solve their problems on their own. So I see the, the Johnson who held the line, as he often called it, in Vietnam as being the same kind of uh, president that fought for civil rights and that even went against his old friend Dick Russell uh, to push the 1964 Act through. He, of course, was aided by the guilt reaction after Kennedy's death, but it wasn't strictly guilt. It was a good deal LBJ's powerful presence that got us that landmark 
decision and perhaps the even more important Voting Rights Act the next year. So the assessment is bound to change. Revisionism is the stuff of presidential history. Uh, about half a century ago, suddenly historians decided that James K. Polk was a great president. No one had thought that. And they began to find virtue in Polk. Harry Truman leaving office with abysmal approval rating suddenly became sainted, sanctified. Uh, not just David McCullough, but a general sense that this little man had stood strong and tall at a time when he was needed. So revisionism will occur with LBJ. It's already occurring. And the switch that you see uh, in terms of domestic policy, I think is a preamble to a, a new view of the whole Johnson period with an effort to stem the tide in uh, Asia from a possible communist takeover during the Cold War and what he was trying to do at home. He was, he remembered his own past and he was, he was frightened by the possibility of China entering the war in the Pacific. So what he did was to limit the so-called terms of engagement, which dictated how we fought the Vietnam War, dictated the fact that you couldn't do certain things in respect to the Ho Chi Minh trails that General Westmoreland and others wanted to have done. Uh, and he, I'm sure, no, I'm not sure, I think uh, overestimated the possibility of a, a, a Chinese entry. Uh, he saw a, a parallel between China entering Korea and China acting as it might do in Vietnam. And after all, he was, his, his ideas in foreign policy were not formulated during the Korean War, but they were fixed, I think. So a false parallel in his mind, I believe, was the Chinese situation in 1950 and the Chinese and the Korean situ and the Chinese situation in respect to Vietnam in the 60s. I, I can understand it, but I I regret it. Uh, and as for uh, Westmoreland's reaction to this in in this library, uh, he said that he felt that he had been forced to fight in Vietnam with his hands tied behind his back, by which he meant that the terms of engagement did not permit him to f conduct the kind of war that might have won if winning had been possible and he felt that it might. Uh, Walt happened to agree with Westmoreland, disagree with the president. Uh, the president knew this uh, and Walt's view was, I'm not elected president. It's his call, not mine. But he, he very much regretted the way the the conduct of the war developed uh, just because in the same argument that Westy put forward uh, later on. Uh, <coughs> James, how are we doing on, you, you yeah. need to change? This would be a good time. Because I, I want to ask a question and, I want, and it's going to involve uh, a little discussion.